A ceasefire on whose terms? The leadership in Ethiopia's rebel region of Tigray setting those terms for a truce in reply to what government forces bill as a unilateral cessation of hostilities. It's also what aid groups worry may in fact be a siege with aid blocked, the internet cut for that rest of region. 1.7 million displaced now face a food crisis, up to 400,000 the potential of famine. Last November's launch of an offensive against uh, Tigray by uh, 2019 Nobel uh, Peace Laureate uh, uh, Abiy Ahmed has not gone to plan, neither for the prime minister nor for his Eritrean allies and the Amhara militias who covet disputed land and fear a return to the days when Tigray enjoyed outsized power in a federal Ethiopia under longtime strongman Meles Zenawi. Will Meles's TPLF sit down with Abiy or try to march on Addis? Do Tigrayans want their autonomy or independence? And what now for Africa's second most populous nation, a continental powerhouse where civilians most certainly do not want an all-out civil war? Today in the France 24 debate, we're looking at what's been a week that was a turning point in Ethiopia's Tigray region. Joining us from Addis Ababa, Samuel Getachu, journalist, uh, is uh, with us there. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. From uh, Las Vegas, Nevada, Faye Van Girmay, representative for the advocacy group Omna Tigre. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. From Rome, Leticia Bader, senior researcher at uh, Human Rights Watch. Thanks for joining us as well. Thank you. And uh, we're joined here in the studio by sociologist uh, Roland Marchal, senior fellow at the French National Research Center, the CNRS. How are you? Thank you. Thank you. The uh, France 24 debate on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24debate, a uh, unilateral ceasefire. It was exactly a week ago. Our attention was uh, squarely on Ethiopia's first general election since Abiy Ahmed came to power. At the same time, government forces were pulling out of Mekele, uh, the Tigrayan capital, where late last week what are claimed to be government soldiers were marched through town towards the Mikeli Rehabilitation uh, Center. Samuel Getachu, what were the reactions in the capital to those images? Uh, it was shock. Um, it was a, a huge surprise, uh, obviously. Uh, but, you know, I spent some time in the Tigray region. Uh, I traveled a few times uh, during the conflicts and even before. And what I've seen, um, you know, I'd like to focus on the humanitarian issues. Uh, because the conversation I had with everyday uh, Ethiopians who reside in the Tigray region was overwhelming. Uh, you know, when the world begins to see the numbers uh, the, uh, behind the faces, we'll begin to understand what the impact of conflicts. There has been endless conflicts and within Ethiopia for many, many years, even before I was born. And what I've seen, what I've heard was so overwhelming. Uh, but again, um, you know, nobody celebrates, uh, nobody should be celebrating the death of uh, any any human beings. Uh, but the number seems to be high. And I've seen, I've seen, I've experienced a glimpse of uh, what conflict is for the first time in my life in the Tigray region. And again, it's really, really, really sad. And I don't think anyone should be celebrating uh, whether it's uh, your either side. Um, you can be on either side. But the fact is people are dying and we have to focus on the humanitarian side of this conflict. We've had um, mixed messages from Ethiopia's leader. At first he said uh, that he'd withdrawn because it was no longer strategic. In Parliament this Monday, the Prime Minister claiming that in one to three weeks, 100,000 trained, armed and organized special forces quote, can be mobilized. He added, if said special force isn't enough, if a militia is needed, uh, half a million militiamen can be organized, one million youths can be mobilized in trains, but officials have decided there should be a period of silence for everyone to think. Uh, Faven Girmay, how do you interpret it when you hear the prime minister talk about a period of silence? Well, first, I do think it's important to note that the unilateral ceasefire came at the heels of a series of major military defeats. He used the premise, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed used the premise of humanitarian aid as a means for making this declaration. But in reality, it was a bruise to his ego and it was an attempt for the Ethiopian government to both save face and cut its resources. The claim that 
100,000 special forces can kind of be able to go to Tigray at any time is also indicative of the fact that he's not committed to a true humanitarian ceasefire, especially because the government has all but instituted a policy of weaponized starvation. We've seen that, as you mentioned, currently over 400,000 Tigrayan, Tigrayans are facing famine, are actually in the brink of famine. An additional 2 million are facing famine. Eritrean forces and Amhara regional forces who are responsible for the most egregious atrocities against Tigrayan civilians are still engaged actively in the western part and southern northern parts of Tigray. And given that their allied forces, who, the communication blackout, we are unsure what atrocities and exacerbation of hum the humanitarian crisis that these forces are doing on the ground. So it's clear that the prime minister is committed to continuing not only the weaponized starvation, but the destruction of the Tigray region. Roland Marshall, do you think the prime minister is committed to, to a campaign of war or that there is a genuine hope that there can be some kind of beginning of political talks? Okay, we, we have to have hope. But uh, yes, uh, this uh, announce of a ceasefire might be just a, a way to winning time and uh, reorganize and, and, and see what happens. The, the question is, uh, the, the prime minister will, will have to show his good face uh, by uh, providing something new, uh, greater, easier access, humanitarian access to international NGOs. Uh, certainly, uh, a more serious discussion about the, the control of the Amara militias and the Eritrean forces, and, and maybe uh, the, as well the opening of, uh, let us say, informal or secret talks with uh, an expression of the, the TPLF. Now, uh, you know, the TPLF uh, may be over-ambitious and uh, overestimate uh, his own victory. That that's, could be a problem. We, we heard uh, different uh, statements that are not very encouraging uh, on one side. On the other side, uh, there is sure Abiy Ahmed is, is just waiting for the result of the uh, national elections, and maybe uh, the Prosperity Party may uh, get uh, such a victory. Uh, that he believes that the, the population is very much behind him, which, of course, will push him to go back to uh, a much tougher policy. We're going to get back to that point of what the TPLF's next move is. But let me first ask you, uh, Leticia Bader, uh, at this point in time, uh, what's the situation when it comes to accessing aid this Monday? Is the Internet back? Is telephone service back? Is electricity back in Tigray? Well, I mean, just before coming into the studio, I was seeing reports that potentially electricity had been partially restored. But what is needed now is, is a lifting of all the restrictions on communications, on the internet, on electricity. This is going to be absolutely critical for the humanitarian community to be able to respond and really respond in, in the, 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 at the level that is required right now. And I think coming back to this whole discussion of a humanitarian ceasefire, it's important to underline that a ceasefire should not have been necessary for there to be unimpeded humanitarian access. And now it's absolutely key that all the warring parties are showing that they are truly committed to, first of all, restoring communication communications, restoring access routes, both um, air routes, road routes, so that the humanitarian response can start today. I mean, I think it's important once again to go back to the very alarming warnings that we were hearing a month ago about the fact that already a third of a million people in Tigray were already starving. That was a month ago. So the response really needs to start now, um, and this needs to happen by all, all, all the parties to the conflict. And just, just a point there, I mean, I think we have repeatedly shown, and, and many organizations have also highlighted, how actions by the warring parties have deliberately resulted in the humanitarian crisis we're talking about today. Yeah, there's, there, there's a lot of finger pointing on both sides. On the hashtag uh, F24 debate, viewers, for instance, asking about well, what could be uh, child soldiers in images filmed by Finnish national broadcaster YLE. This is at a, uh, a Tigrayan a rebel camp. When you look at those images there, uh, Roland Marshall, uh, in that report, by the way, fighters boasting about the youth 
uh, joining the armed uh, struggle. Uh, your your reaction when you see very young people, they they look like they're underage in those images. Yes, indeed. I well, I remember the uh, 1980s, actually, where uh, when the, this, uh, this problem was as well uh, quite huge among uh, uh, forces fighting the Derg, and whether on the Eritrean or the Ethiopian side. And, and this, this should be a concern as well as uh, the way uh, prisoners of war are treated by uh, TDF uh, these days. And, and, and again, uh, you know, I do not believe that uh, humanitarian um, uh, conditions or concerns are only humanitarian. They, they just prove that a political dialogue uh, is, uh, is possible and, and again is worth uh, taking the risk of. Is it a repeat of the 1980s when uh, s f starvation was a weapon of war? Yes, time? starvation was used and uh, displacement of population was used by all uh, in order to prove uh, to the international uh, community that, uh, that really the DERG was, uh, was criminal. And indeed it was. Uh, maybe the other side wasn't as innocent as some uh, thought at that time. The, the point today is how could we uh, repair this situation, save people, but as well, uh, you know, build the conditions, uh, the, the confidence, so that a discussion, a conversation could start as quickly as possible and, and stop uh, the war uh, dynamic, uh, as well as, uh, you know, try to uh, envision what, what kind of conditions would be necessary for a, a full uh, dialogue among the different parties. And of course, a resolution, a, a solution that do not put the old uh, population in, in, in such a situation. Samuel Gatachu, when you see how uh, caustic uh, the rhetoric is on social media and in public pronouncements, you get the sense that uh, neither side seems to want to really sit down at this point. Um, you know, before I answer your question, let me reflect on my time in the Tigray region. Uh, I remember traveling to uh, Aksum uh, and uh, stopping by. We saw this older lady. I was with uh, German TV, and uh, we stopped, and uh, we had a conversation with her. And she took us to her village, um, and what she reflected was, uh, you know, most of her animals, uh, I mean, at least some of her animals, were chopped out, like they chopped parts of her, the body of the animals. So she won't be in a position to feed herself too far and be given the right to feed her family and her kids, her grandkids. And those are the memories I have of uh, traveling to the Tigray region. Uh, you know, everything when it comes to the Tigray region has become a wedge issue. Uh, when it comes to Ethiopian politics, we're expected to follow the lines of maybe our ethnic backgrounds. But, you know, the insults that has been going back and forth between the leadership of uh, TPLF and the Ethiopian government leads me to believe that this conflict is far from over. Um, you know, they're sending all kinds of accusations and insults. The UN is coming in the middle saying they're going to investigate. But I don't think the world cares about black people enough to investigate and um, have enough resources to do a proper investigation. And I don't think Ethiopia is in a position or has the resources to investigate. But what has happened in the Tigray region without taking sides or making accusations is overwhelming. It's really, really sad. When we looked at the Rwanda experience of 1994, we were supposed to take uh, um, a lesson from it. I don't think the world has taken a lesson. And we're all guilty of it. All right. Uh, last week's announcement of that unilateral withdrawal by the government forces uh, was followed late last week with alarming news of uh, several destroyed bridges over the uh, Tezeke River. The UN's World Food Program, uh, in a strongly worded statement, announcing that even prior to the destruction, the agency's aid was being held up, a claim staunchly rejected in Addis Ababa. The insinuations that we are trying to suffocate the Tigrayan people by denying humanitarian access and using anger as a, a weapon of war is beyond the pale. This is absolutely no reason for us to do so. These are our people. So, Feven Girmay, when you respond to that, 
How do you step away from it being, uh, again, this caustic rhetoric where it's one side says it's all the other side's fault? Well, I think we have to look at who has a history of impeding humanitarian access throughout the course of this war, and that is the Ethiopian government. The Ethiopian forces, along with their allies, both the Eritrean forces and the Amhara regional forces, have left a trail of scorched earth. They've burned crops, they killed livestock, they've consistently looted emergency aid that was intended to go to the Tigray region. They have blocked aid agencies from reaching the most devastating parts of the region. We saw Abiy Ahmed consistently demonize humanitarian workers, after which three MSF workers were killed, two of which were Tigrayan. We saw recent, most recently that four tons of humanitarian aid was blocked from reaching Western Tigray. So what we see here is a consistent pattern by the Ethiopian government to withhold aid and essentially starve the people of Tigray. The idea that, also I do want to make a note that the um, aid agencies reportedly attributed the bombing of the Tekeza Bridge to Amhada special forces. So the idea that TIG, the TDF forces who've consistently asked for unfettered humanitarian aid and who have stock in the livelihoods of the Tigrayan people would be responsible for the bombing of the bridge is preposterous. Also, we also have to look at the consistent lies that this administration has told since the inception of since the beginning of this war. Remember, they indicated that Eritrean forces were no longer present in Tigray. They indicated just two weeks ago that there was no hunger in Tigray, despite the fact that the UN and USA aid have consistently reported contrary to that fact. Leticia Badia, when you think back to November the 4th, when this offensive was launched, did you see all this coming? I mean, we didn't see much because, as we've been also experiencing in, in the last uh, week or so, there was a communication shutdown. The internet was shut down. So we were very much in the dark for, for six weeks. I mean, we started to get a sense of the true magnitude and, and tragedy of what had unfolded in the first two months, so in the initial offensive. Um, particularly in Western Tigray, by traveling to Sudan and meeting with tens of thousands of refugees that had fled predominantly from Western Tigray at the time. Could we have expected what came next? No. Um, the, the, the magnitude, the gravity, the horrors um, that Samuel was pointing to and Haben as well were, were, were not um, expected. But, but there is now ample evidence of the severity of the abuses, of the deliberate nature of a lot of the atrocities we have been documented, documenting both in terms of targeting of the male and boy population for killings in reprisal massacres, notably in the historic time of Aksum in late November, but we have repeatedly received similar credi credible reports of such reprisal killings throughout um, the fighting and through to date. Um, at the same time, widespread reports of sexual violence by women and girls. And of course, I think it's important to underline again and again that what we are talking about are just the reported cases. This is also a conflict which has seen, as Médecins Sans Frontières has described, the deliberate attacks on medical facilities, on health facilities. Mm. So what we are talking about in terms of reported cases is just the tip of the iceberg. And we're going to be looking at uh, one of those examples of medical facilities being attacked with an exclusive report when we come back. Stay with us. You're watching the France 24 debate. Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate and we're at what some have called a turning point for Tigray, uh, which is home to a little more than 5% of uh, Ethiopia's population. It had outsized power during uh, the long reign of Meles Zanawi. It uh, was the subject of an attack by uh, government forces and the Eritrean army at the beginning of November. And it's taken back its regional capital last week. We're talking about it with from Addis Ababa, journalist Samuel uh, Gatachu from Las Vegas, Nevada. Faye Van Girmay, representative of the advocacy group uh, Omna Tigre 
from Rome, Leticia Bader, senior researcher at uh, Human Rights Watch, and uh, sociologist uh, Roland Marshall, senior fellow at the French National Research uh, Center, the CNRS. Yeah, up to 400,000, we were stating it in part one of our discussion, faced the, Im the immediate threat of starvation. France 24 correspondent Maria Gerth Nicolescu went to Tigre and filed this report. Two months ago, this man lost everything. At the heart of Tigray's mountains, Eritrean soldiers massacred residents in his village. These graves built in the hollow of a cliff are the only visible trace of the killing. My wife was called Haiwa. She was a mother of five. One month ago, she gave birth to a baby. We also had daughters. Their names were Tesla, Zuvan, and Rael. We were not able to pray for them because we had to run for our lives. Nineteen people were killed in one day. On that day, there were many Eritrean soldiers. They were uncountable. As they were passing through this area, people were simply staying in their homes. The soldiers brought all the residents together and then killed them all here. Since the beginning of the conflict, Eritrean soldiers have been backing the Ethiopian army against dissident Tigrayan forces. Many witnesses accuse Eritreans of having massacred and raped civilians throughout the region. Like here, most rural areas are difficult to access for NGOs. Because of the war, this medical team is often forced to return to the regional capital, Mekele. And even when there's no fighting, its movements are restricted. Today we planned to go to a village and people were expecting us. But on the way there, we were stopped at a checkpoint by Ethiopian soldiers. They turned us back, even though we told them we were going to treat women and children. We're very worried about people in remote villages without access to health care. The team finally stops in this small village in central Tigray. People here have been in dire need of medical assistance ever since the local clinic was attacked. This center was treating patients until mid-January, but then the Ethiopian military destroyed it. They took everything and tore it apart. Over there is the fridge. They broke it and left it. They threw out children's vaccines and medicines so that they're now unusable. In these rural areas, accessing medical treatment has become extremely difficult. Even food is now difficult to find. Children especially are suffering from malnutrition. I measured 11.4. It's a decrease. So I'm giving you a form that will entitle you to special food. Because of a shortage of ambulances, some women die in labor, like this baby's mother three months ago. For the past days, the family has been unable to find milk. Her aunt feeds her ground cereal. We're going to weigh her. Mm. We found this baby by chance. If we'd come later, we could have easily missed her. There are many babies just like her, and their mothers don't have milk. These children are too underweight, and what we give them won't be enough to save them. And the town closest to the village is deserted, and its economy at a standstill. To help those most in need, some organizations, sometimes supported by the government, are trying to distribute wheat and seeds. We have a plan to distribute about 2,900 uh, quintal of uh, seeds, which is used for uh, 12,780 farmers. We are in, in distributed to the most vulnerable people, but it is not uh, covered to the whole our people. The unilateral ceasefire declared by the government on June 28th could come as a relief amid an alarming humanitarian situation. According to the UN, 350,000 people are facing famine in Tigray. Leticia Badia, you heard in part one of our discussion uh, Samuel Gattaccio warning that the international community isn't going to step in for this. Nonetheless, we have seen strongly worded statements, both by the European Union and by the United States, uh, denouncing this blocking of access uh, to, to aid. Uh, what's the next step for the international community? 
Yeah, I mean, the messaging and the alarm bells have definitely increased, but it is in, in many ways very late, um, I would argue. And I think this is something which has come up again and again in our interviews with survivors, victims, communities on the ground in Tigres, is really this sense of being abandoned, first of all, by the federal government. This was something which we heard very clearly in December last year at the beginning of the conflict, but much more recently has been this sense of being abandoned by the world. Um, and so I think what needs to happen now is very clear, is that wording is positive, but there needs to be much more concrete action. So we saw on Friday the first public meeting at the level of the Security Council on Ethiopia, on the situation in Tigray. But that needs to become a standing agenda item at the level of the UN Security Council. And it needs to go hand in hand with concrete actions. Now is not the time to be dilly-dallying. Now is the time for there to be a clear message from a whole range of actors. It's absolutely key for the African Union leadership um, and individual African leaders on the continent to express their alarm with the situation on the ground to put pressure with all actors involved to ensure at a minimum that there is unimpeded humanitarian access at the moment, but also that there are real investigations on the ground. I think coming to the whole question of investigations, it's going to be key for everyone to allow independent UN monitors to do an international investigation on the ground. It is critical right now that warring parties, notably those that are also moving and pulling out of the region, are not destroying key evidence, including including evidence of massacres, which is something we are very concerned about. Um, but it's also really key for the international community to start talking about what accountability needs to look like. Faye Van Girme, we've uh, heard uh, both sides express distrust in uh, the United Nations. Um, so if there is going to be substantive talks, who's going to broker them? Well, I think... First, the AU has expressed a willingness to broker negotiations. Also, Sudan has, al Sudan has also indicated their willingness to broker negotiations. What essentially the TPLF, the Tigray government, has been asking for are negotiations since the start of this war. However, the prime minister has refused to do so. It was only, like I said earlier, a month ago that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs gawked at the possibility of potential ceasefire. But after military defeat is when the, the Tigray government has essentially forced their hand. So I think America also has expressed a willingness to bro broker peace talks, which I believe the Tigray government would be more than welcome for, welcome up. And to have talks, you need to have both sides willing to come to the table. Uh, De Bretzion, uh, Gebre Michael, uh, who is the leader of the TPFL, who's been lying low for months, uh, telling the New York Times that, of course, Tigrayans have to fight back when attacked. Uh, as for marching on Addis or Asmara, the capital of neighboring Eritrea, where strongman Isaiah Safawaki has been in power since independence in 1991, he says, quote, we have to be realistic. Yes, we would like to remove uh, Isaias, but at the end of the day, Eritreans ha have to uh, remove him. Uh, Roland Marshall, um, De Bretzian Gebre Michael uh, is is now reemerged from uh, from the hills. Uh, is this now going to be the broker with, that sits down with Abiy Ahmed, or is this uh, is this <laughs> actually actually uh, Redux it, it, 1991? Actually, it was one of the TPLF leaders who wanted to have uh, a warmer relations with Abiy Ahmed at first in uh, in 2018. And, and therefore, uh, yes, he, he could have been uh, the man of uh, this uh, renewed uh, negotiation with Addis Abeba. I'm not sure today he is uh, as influential as he used to be in the past. And I think Abiy Ahmed missed uh, a real opportunity to have a, a genuine uh, negotiation. Now, going to... Uh, if he's not as influential, then who's running... The show in Tigray. Uh, I believe today those who are the, 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 the military wing and the militarists among the military wing are certainly the most influential. Yes, indeed. And so what's their, what's their plan? Is it to fight the Amhara militias, yeah, to, to go free, to the Sudanese border? Yeah. 
Uh, you know, the, what is unclear is up to what extent they realize that history can't not repeat itself, uh, except as a farce. Yeah, just uh, to remind our viewers here, in 1991, uh, the regime of, Haile, uh, of Mengistu Haile Mariam Haile. is toppled with the rebellion that starts in Tigray. Yeah, Tigray, Eritrea, because the EPLF actually played a major role to weaken the Ethiopian army. OLF, the Oromo Liberation Front, was not very well organized as uh, Tigray or TPLF or EPLF, but was extremely active. There were other sm smaller groups that existed. The regime itself in Addis Abeba was uh, ba basically already collapsing. Uh, Mengistu actually escaped to Zimbabwe uh, long before the regime uh, collapsed in Addis Abeba. And so you're saying history doesn't repeat itself? No, I do not. And I, and I hope that uh, the, the Tigrayan uh, leaders will understand that uh, they, they, they shouldn't have uh, those kind of hopes uh, because that will bring, uh, uh, you know, destruction everywhere. And at the end of the day, they are going to, they will lose the, this, this war uh, the same way others lost in the past. Samuel Getachew, when you hear Roland Marshall say that right now uh, in Michele, the capital of Tigray, if it's the military wing that has more sway, how does that bode? Well, you can never discount the leader of uh, the face of the struggle that just happened. Uh, you know, uh, the president of uh, TPLF, uh, while he has been declared uh, as a terrorist, uh, he is um, welcomed uh, by activists. Uh, we can never deny the fact that who that's who he is. He has become uh, the face of uh, what happened. Uh, and the triumph uh, that happened in Macaulay, that's a fact. But the reality is, um, while your guest talks about history, what worries me the most is that even today, people are dying in many, many parts of uh, the Tigray region. And, you know, to be honest, um, I, I'm not trying to discount what's happening in the Tigray region. Uh, what's been happening is all over uh, Ethiopia. Uh, you know, I came back to Ethiopia from Canada um, you know, I love being in Canada. I was more interested in Canadian politics. Uh, but in the four years or the five years I've been to Ethiopia, the country has truly changed. It's been a roller coaster. Uh, it's been changing. Uh, there was hope at the beginning, but now... A Nobel uh, Peace Prize be, uh, after the peace treaty with neighboring Eritrea in 2019. Sure. I was on the first flight to Asmara. Um, I enjoyed uh, the history. I wanted to be part of the history. Uh, you know, it was a moment of uh, where were you when uh, East, Af uh, East uh, Germany became independent or uh, got freed? Uh, was, uh, was that moment for us. But things have changed and it worries me the most. What wor worries me and my colleagues the most is that too many people are dying and uh, I mean, something needs to change in Ethiopia, and I'm just speaking from the heart. Why did, Samuel, why did Abiy Ahmed launch this offensive? I really don't know. I'm not a citizen of Ethiopia. It's a question you should ask Ethiopians. Uh, but from what I've seen, um, Ethiopia had problems long before he came to power. Um, I used to travel all over Ethiopia. I was asked my, my ethnic uh, background. Uh, more than my citizenship. Um, there was times when I was attacked with my colleagues uh, because they assumed I was, quote-unquote, the wrong tribe. Uh, it began before him. I'm not obviously blaming anyone. I'm just stating a fact. Um, so Ethiopians became more of an ethnic blocks than citizens, and that was the beginning of the problem to Ethiopia. And it, it was a problem that existed long before the prime minister came to power. Faith and Girmay, on a previous show, there were some who um, resented how under Meles Zanawi this concept of ethnic federalism took hold and saying that's part of the reason why today we have Tigrayans versus Amhara militias and, uh, as we said, these regional that rivalries that are more ethnic rivalries. Well, it's important to note that ethnic divisions predate the TPLF. It's actually been since the inception of modern-day Ethiopia. Um, that dating back to Menelik, the forced colonization of the Oromo people, their persecution of over 5 million 
the forced um, assimilation policies of Haile Selassie. So there has been um, the subjugation of varying ethnic groups, especially throughout history, the Nana Shoah Amhara ethnic groups that have not only that not only predate TPLF, but have occurred throughout the course of Ethiopian history. So this notion that TPLF brought ethnic federalism and all of a sudden that's when Ethiopians became cognizant of their ethnic identity is ridiculous. How do we step away from it now, though? Well, first, it's a dialogue. A lot of um, historically subjugated and oppressed minorities, what they want is a stake in the political sphere. So the first thing that needs to happen is free dialogue and negotiations. Currently, we have a series of Oromo political prisoners. We have Tigrayans of um, both non-politicians being intimidated, persecuted, and arrested based solely on their ethnicity. These things need to come in, to an end, and there be, needs to be an, an inclusive dialogue amongst politicians and people from various ethnicities on next steps forward. Trying to force all of Ethiopians into one into a strong central unitary state is making them feel that they're going to lose all the benefits in terms of their linguistic um, rights, their cultural rights that they've been able to express during the TPLF regime and ethnic federalism. So we need to make sure that those rights are safeguarded, and that can only be done through an inclusive dialogue. And what's the future for Tigray? Is it uh, as um, uh, uh, back to the status that it had before all of this happened? Uh, is it more autonomy? Is it independence? Well, I can't postulate what um, will happen. That's going to be dependent on the people of Tigray and the Tigrayan government who serves the people of Tigray on next steps forward. What I think is most important is that we address the humanitarian crisis because people are dying, starving to death. And that is, needs to be of utmost concern, both for the Tigray government, which I believe it is, but more importantly, for the central government, who has all but ignored the Tigrayan people and their suffering. Leticia Badia, when you look at right now the urgency that we've been repeating throughout this show, which is to get food to people, and you look at that map again, uh, what's the best route right now? Um, what's the best way to get the food in? Well, I mean, I, all the routes need to be opened up right now, basically, in order to ensure that the the, the scale of the, the 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 scale up, basically, of the response that is required and necessary can happen. Um, I mean, I think this is something that obviously you would need to discuss more with humanitarian actors, but it's pretty clear until possibly in the last 24 hours that most of those routes were blocked off, um, and so now they all need to open up to enable that scale up to happen. I think it's important to come back to the questions you were asking earlier um, to Fazan. Um and to Samuel, I mean, one of the issues we've been raising again and again over the last two years, well, three years, I would argue, is that there is a need for um, avenues for grievances which exist, which are very real. And I think, as, as, as other participants have mentioned, they have been around for decades, even longer. It's very clear that over the last decade, avenues for grievances to be expressed in a nonviolent manner have repeatedly been restricted. And this happened, obviously, under the EPRDF, but it's also happened under the Abbey administration. And it's something we have been underlining again and again, the fact that, as Fazan just mentioned, much of the political, um, across the political spectrum, you currently have a number of key political leaders who are still lingering in detention at the the moment, one year on from the arrest of, of a number of them, I mean, is, is a problem right now. So it's absolutely key for these, these commitments or um, um, questions about a moment of silence, um, of potential reflection to actually go hand in hand with very concrete steps to show that people who have different opinions on the future of the country have a space to argue, to, 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 to voice them. And I think, unfortunately, Obviously, given what's been happening in the last eight months, there are obviously other key um, um, actions and commitments which really need to, to, to be met by concrete actions right now. But, but this is a fundamental issue which needs to be resolved as soon as possible as well. Roland Marshall, your thoughts on this before we go? Because <clears throat> in 2005, uh, EPRDF was very close to lose power 
because he saw that he could uh, actually allow elections to be organized Melezenawi. and and then Melezenawi, and then uh, opposition could uh, express itself and, and so on. And then uh, a couple of days before the election day, he found out that he was going to lose. Therefore, uh, this, they, they rigged the election, they, um, they put in jail uh, the dozens of thousands of people. And then the EPRDF uh, strategy changed radically. What they did was basically to uh, multiply, multiply, multiply the number of uh, the membership so that they would control everything, not only middle and top level. They will control villages, uh, uh, on, on neighborhoods, and so on, so that nobody, nobody could express a view that is a dissent against the government. This strategy has been successful to control the elections up to 2015, but what the end result of this was that the only way to express an opposition even not radical opposition, was eventually to go to violence. And this, what has been happening for the last six years, and therefore, if you want to challenge this, to open a space, ways for people to, to find a way to, to claim what they, they believe is their right, you, you will need to not only to talk to the leadership, you will need to change the, the patterns of politics at the local level, and this really needs a leadership that I haven't seen, neither in TPLF for so many decades, nor in Abi France today in power in Addis Abeba. So I must say personally, um, I feel this is an opinion more than an analysis because my, my job is to analyze the past. But if I look the future, I'm actually not very optimistic about what may happen in, in Ethiopia. All right, well, let's hope you're proved wrong. Hold on, yes, Marcia. I hope. I want to thank you so much. I want to thank as well Samuel Gatachu for being with us from uh, Addis Ababa, Faven Girme in Las Vegas, Laetitia Bader in Rome. Thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate.